Good morning. Another beautiful day. The sun is shining. Birds are chirping. Pray that you can get out and enjoy another beautiful day in God's country. Uh, but today, as we spend our time indoors, we're going to be looking at that continuing story of God uh, recorded in Genesis. We Last time we got together, picked up with Abraham, God's call to this man named Abram, who would later become Abraham. And now we're going to look at a few of the instances in his life where Abram shows strength. There are many times in his life where he doesn't show strength. But in all of these times, the good and the bad, God is teaching him to trust. Teaching him to trust in God's promises. That's the underlying lesson in the life of Abram. God's patience with him and teaching him to trust. Today we're going to look at what I, I believe is a very uh, awesome, uplifting account of Abram showing that trust in God, and God proving himself trustworthy. I'll give you the background. Abram has gone to the promised land and taken a couple of members of his family with him, of course his wife Sarah, and Sarah I at this time, and his nephew Lot. One of God's promises was that he was going to be financially successful, and anybody who partnered with Abram would benefit from that. Lot did. They became so wealthy that the flocks that they raised could not graze all within the same area there were just too many and fighting broke out among their workers and Abram wouldn't have it he wouldn't want fighting within the family and so he tells Lot to go where he wants to go you take whatever land you see fit I'll go the other direction Abram knowing that in the middle of the desert God could bless him and God would so Lot goes down to the valley to a certain number of towns or five cities that were recorded there uh, three of them, which are of note, Sodom, Gomorrah, and Salem, which would become Jerusalem. Now, as time passes, Lot finds himself in a spot of trouble because these five kingdoms have come into conflict with four more powerful, more ruthless kingdoms in the north under the command of a king named Keterleomer. And Keterleomer and his allies come to war against these five southern kingdoms, and they conquer them. And some of the captives that were taken away included Lot and his family. Now that's where we're going to pick up today. Um, Abram, when he hears this, responds in kind. And this section is taken from Genesis chapter 14. We're going to begin at verse 13. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard this, that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah to the north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. This is God's word. And it's a fun word to read. I like this one because you see confidence that is well-founded, confidence in God, and God showing that that confidence is well-placed. I like to look at this, though, through the eyes of one of the other men here. Let's pick one of the three brothers, Eshcol. Imagine this through the eyes of Eshcol. Now, Eshcol had lived there for a long time. He knew how things went. When these northern kings demanded tribute, you paid because they were stronger than you were. Now, his brothers who lived in the area did not. His relatives did not. And they found out what happened. They were taken captive. But now, Abram comes to his allies, Mamre, Eshcol, and Aner, and says that they're going to fight. We know that they went with because at the end of verse 14, he talks about his allies who went with. But what might have gone through Eshcol's mind? Now, we know how things are. These, these kings are too strong for us. And hear this, this uppity Hebrew who's only lived here for 10 years is going to come and tell us that we can go fight them? It's not how it works. I'm not going with. But then... Abram's confidence must have bled through and inspired them. And perhaps Abram shared with them what God had shared with Abram. That promise that whoever curses him will be cursed by God. And 
God had given Abram a promise of a great family, which would necessarily start with a child, and Abram hadn't had any children. So, logically, if Abram were killed in this battle, childless, that would make God a liar. And one thing Abram is starting to learn very well, God doesn't lie. So Abram has absolute confidence. He has his 318 trained men, shepherds, tough guys who are used to fighting off bandits and wild animals, no soldiers. But he's going to take these 318 men and go fight these four northern kings. And Mamre, Ashkol, and Aner go with. And what happens? They win. From our standpoint, yeah, of course they win. Because God had told them that they were going to win. But from the standpoint of these three men who knew differently, this must have been a very inspiring day. They win, and then they come back, and they come back with all of the possessions. And then the king of Sodom comes out to talk to Abram, and Abram says, all of the possessions are yours. They belong to you. You won the battle. Just give me the people back. Abram says this. With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Abram, in the euphoria of victory, remembers that this victory was given to him by God. And he was not going to let anybody believe that it was him or that it was them. That the success came because of his intellect or the power that he wielded. No, this was God's. And you, you can cheer for Abram because he gets it. What a beautiful thing. He gets it. What's the takeaway? You know, yesterday we talked about God's promises and how Abram went into the future because he heard God's promises. And so he had a picture of how the world was going to be, how life was going to be. Here he shows not only did he hear it and believe it, but because he believed it, he walked in step with it. He didn't just believe it from a distance and say, yeah, 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 I believe this. He showed that he believed this by doing what God told him to do. Even when everybody else was saying, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how the world works. That's how God works. Abraham knew it, and Abraham was blessed because of it. Now, the takeaway? You know, there are certain things that make sense to us, how the world works, how we use our resources, our time, all the things at our disposal, because that's how the world works. That's what makes sense. But God says differently. God says when you structure your life, put my promises first. Trust what I say. Live your lives accordingly. Always consider firsthand what God wants for you, what God wants of you. And then human reason, the world, that comes next. When you put God first, his thoughts, his commands, his promises, that's when life clicks, to walk in step with God's promises. It's a beautiful passage where Jesus says just this in Matthew chapter 6. Beginning at verse 31, he says, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The lesson, walk in step with God's promises. Don't just acknowledge them and watch them from a distance. Structure your lives by them. Make them the priority in your life, and that is when life will click. God promises his blessings, just as he did to Abraham. God promises his blessing to us. May he give us the commitment, the clarity of mind to do this, and to watch God's blessings flow. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we remember a number of our brothers and sisters. First of all, we pray on behalf of Gloria Osmanski who is going to be going in for surgery on Monday. We pray that God gives skill to her doctors and that he holds her in his hand. Also, a prayer of thanks on behalf of Andrew Bublitz, um, who has struggled for years with a, a number of, of, of difficult ailments um, that he's been going through. Many of you know those. 
and recently was hospitalized with a very severe case of pneumonia. Today, I understand he was released, so we thank God for this and ask that God continue to strengthen him and heal him. And so we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that you give and the blessings that you promise. Help us to trust your promises so that we see these blessings, uh, so that we rejoice in them and live our lives in thanks to you. Help us to walk in step with your promises so that we might live by your power. We ask that you extend that power to Gloria. This Monday as she goes in for surgery, we ask that you give the doctors skill, uh, precision as they operate, but you ultimately are the great physician and we ask that you heal her, that you bring her home and that you restore her to health. We thank you for Andrew. We thank you for the care that you continue to show him despite the pain that he has faced, which undoubtedly you have given him strength through. We, we thank you for returning him home and we ask that you continue to strengthen him, heal him and give comfort to his family. And in all things, we ask that you hold us in your hands, guide us, and determine our steps according to your will, our future according to your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God be with you.